All righty. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our WACAC virtual college exploration session. Um, before we get started, as folks are trickling into this webinar, just a couple of things that I just want to make sure to remind of everyone. Um, you are going to have your microphone and your camera turned off during the session for our attendees. Um, so we are going to ask that you post questions to the Q&A chat box that you have. Um, and we will make sure that as well, um, all of our questions that may not be addressed during the panel today are gonna to be sent to the panelists. So if they want to um, reach out afterwards to just provide any more information, they'll be able to do so by all means. We are going to have more sessions available through WACAC.com. Um, and then after this event is over, all the other recordings for sessions are also going to be available at WACAC.com. So if you had conflicting sessions that you know you wanna go back and listen to, that will also be available to you as well. Without further ado, I'm going to let our panelists take it away. Hi everyone, my name is Jen Gross and I'm gonna share my screen right now. We have a PowerPoint presentation to share with you today. And, oops, oops. All right, I hope you can see that. Um, we are here to talk to you about being undecided, undeclared, or undetermined. You know, how do you know where to start even the college search if you're not sure what you wanna do just yet? So we're going to address some of those issues. But first of all, I think we're going to go ahead and introduce ourselves. You've got three panelists here. Uh, we'll each introduce ourselves. My name is Jen Gross. I work with the University of Denver. I've been with them um, about 20 years now. And I work with students primarily in the Midwest. So I handle students in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And I'm from the Midwest, so I'm a little bit biased towards my Midwest kids. But we're so happy to have you here. And I will let Jill go ahead. Hi everybody, my name is Jill Countryman and I work for Texas Christian University. Go Horn Frogs. Uh, we're located in Fort Worth, Texas, which is North Central Texas. We have about 9,500 undergraduate students and I am the admission counselor for Wisconsin and some other uh, Midwest states. I've been at TCU for 15 years, so happy you're here. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Siegel. I'm with Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, which is a large public research university in the Big Ten Athletic Conference, about 33,000 undergrads and another 10,000 grad students. Um, IU is my alma mater, and I've worked at IU for about 20 years. Um, I primarily work with students in uh, the Midwest as well, uh, the Chicago area, as well as Wisconsin and Minnesota and the Dakotas. I'm glad to be here today to talk about this topic. So let's tell you what we have planned for you today. We've already done the panel introductions. So we wanna talk a little bit about the college search process for undecided students. You know, students that might have a major, um, might have a little bit of an edge trying to figure out where they're gonna go because they can use that as part of the search process. However, you know, how do you do this if you're not sure what you wanna do? What are some things that you're gonna look at? I'll talk on that topic. Then Jill will come in and give you some application tips for undecided students. And then we'll have Scott come in and talk about college experience for undecided students. So now that you, decided on your school and you're there, how can, what can happen at that point in time? And then again, we're gonna have a Q&A session at the end. So we please encourage you to add those questions that you might have in that Q&A area as we go along. They can be specific to us, they can be about this topic that we're talking about um, or something that might come up as we're, we're giving our presentation. So don't forget to add those questions. So the undecided search process, how do you start when you don't even know what you wanna do? Let's take a look at what we know, <clears throat> we know that 20 to 50% of high school graduates nowadays will enter college undecided, undeclared, or undetermined. And trust me, it's all good. You guys are in the majority. And when you're looking at schools, TCU is a little bit smaller school with their freshman class. They have about 5% of their students coming in unde undecided or undeclared. DU, we're a medium-sized school right around 12 um, to 13, or yeah, 1200, 1200? no, yeah, 1200 to 1300. And we're looking at about 30%. And then IU, Indiana is a bigger university and they're coming in at 60% of their students undecided. So we wanna share with you information so that you know whatever size school that you pick, you're gonna know that you can go at that school undecided or undetermined and be able to accomplish what you wanna do and find out where that passion is. And even if you do have an idea of what you wanna major in, 75% of those students are gonna change their major at least once. 
if not twice, and you might even bring in a double major or maybe major and minors. So when you're looking at this college search process, one question you probably get asked quite a bit is, what do you want to major in? You get asked by, by your parents, you get asked by your friends, by relatives. I always tell students, you know, the best answer to give is liberal arts. And why would you tell someone you want to major in liberal arts? Liberal arts kind of leads you wide open. Schools have, most schools have a curriculum that is based on a major, but also based on a foundation of core courses that you would take. So you would take different majors across the disciplines. You might take some social sciences. You might take a math requirement. There might be something with a foreign language or even arts and humanities. But this gives you a broad base of classes to help complement what you're doing. So essentially, you're coming in and you're saying, I'm going to major in liberal arts, meaning I'm going to look at everything until I find an option that works right for me. So why is it good to come in as an undecided student? One, you are not stuck in one major area of study. You've got a lot of opportunities to kind of go out there and find out where is that niche? What really resonates with me? And you know what? You might have an area of study that you're interested in or that you've enjoyed in high school or that you're curious about. Take those classes. And, you know, taking these classes across the disciplines, across all those different areas, can eliminate what you're not interested in. Technically, when you're going to school, you're taking a variety of classes and you'll find out what you like to do, but more importantly, what you don't want to do. That way you can eliminate those areas and really focus in on things that are important to you and things that you find interesting and career options you're considering. Um, you're not going to lose ground with the classes that you take that aren't going to go towards a major. They can be applied to a variety of different areas. Maybe you pick up a minor and you put that, that, elect, that area to there, or an elective. An elective is just an, an extra class that you've taken. Or again, those foundation or core liberal arts requirements that some of the schools have. So you're not gonna lose any ground because those classes will count for something. Um, and who knows, as you're taking all these different types of classes, the areas that you're interested in, curious about, you might find a subject that is a new passion for you, something that you wanna pursue, or even have a conversation with a faculty member about you know, research or an area that, that just sparks your interest. So you never know what you're going to find out by taking some of these classes. So I always, you know, when you find college, it's about fit. Major is part of that fit, but also there's a lot of other things. So what I always tell students, you want to find a place that will provide you an educational opportunity, the one that you need, in an environment that you feel comfortable in. And that's something that I think is really important. Um, you know, find as many things that are part of what you want in a college or university. So when we look at some of these things, size. Size is important. You, maybe you want a small school that has only a few thousand students. Maybe you want a medium-sized school like DU that has, you know, just under 13,000. Um, 13, maybe you want a larger mega university. When you're looking at size, you know, you, you can find out, you know, what do they have to offer? What are the requirements? And also you're gonna look at what is the class size? What is the student faculty ratio? Maybe it's very important to you to have that faculty member that you can go to when you have questions. Maybe it's more important for you to be in a group of people getting all that information. A lot of it also depends on your learning style. And then location. You know, look at where would you like to be? And I would say don't discount places just because you've never been there before. I had never been to Denver or Colorado before I actually interviewed for my job, and my perception was it's cold, it snows, everybody skis, I don't think that's me. And I was pretty wrong with that perception. Not everybody skis, it has 300 days of sunshine a year, and snow will melt by noon or one o'clock in the city, which is really amazing for our, us Midwesterners. And no humidity or mosquitoes because the altitude and, and the lack of that, that moisture, that humidity. So, Take a look at schools that you might not even consider is what I'm really trying to get at with that point. Um, do you want to go rural, a small, small area, um, a large city or town, an urban area? Do you want something that's in a residential location? Is, do you need things nearby you? So kind of take a look at those, especially when you're looking at colleges and universities. You know, find out and explore what's in those areas. Another thing to consider is the academic calendar. There are a lot of different types of um, when students will, will take their classes, there's the semester system. There are there's schools that do one class at a time. There are schools that will do a semester system with a J term, meaning they take the month of January and will do a class, one class at that time, or a May term where they would take the month of May 
after their two semesters and do a class or a place that has trimesters or like the University of Denver, we have quarters. Um, each one offers a little bit different opportunities for students and can be really beneficial for those students coming in undeclared or undecided. For instance, with DU, with the University of Denver, we're on the quarter system. Our students take about 12 to 18 courses for the year. They're broken down into 10 week sections, but it allows our students to take about 30% more classes normally than a semester system would. But maybe the one class at a time might work for you. Um, I know Cornell College in Iowa does one class at a time and you take it for a, take one class straight for that week <laughs> for a few weeks there and then you go on to the next topic area. So take an idea, take, an, take note as to what you might like to do as far as that academic calendar is concerned. Um, activities and organizations might be important to you. Maybe you are, are an athlete, maybe you're division one, division three, maybe you just want to do intramurals, you know, there's outreach. Maybe you are the type of person that wants to continually give back to the community and you want to find a school that offers those opportunities to you. There's fraternity and sorority systems. There's student senate. Um, and then there's also living learning opportunities at a lot of colleges and universities. And I know Scott will talk on that a little bit more, but that allows you to live on a floor with a group with students with a common interest. So there's a lot of different activities and organizations to consider things that you are currently involved in or things that you are interested in getting involved in in college. And then there's things that are kind of like in that miscellaneous category. Every school has a study abroad program, but maybe it's, you know, you look at a, at a school that has a specific study abroad program where they go to one location and all their students go to that location and it's part of the actual educational opportunity. Or maybe you will go and look at a school that has their own specific program or works with a consortium of different colleges and universities for their students to study abroad. You know, find out if it's um, what the cost is. Maybe there is no additional cost to study abroad. Do you, we, we do it that way. Our students that have a 3.0 can study abroad at no additional cost. Also, research might be important to you. Some schools will have research opportunities available for um, undergraduates and some students will have them for the graduate level there's always an opportunity to get involved with faculty and what they're doing. So go ahead and pay attention to those opportunities. And then academic support might be important as well. Somebody that might have a learning difference or um, maybe there's a physical disability and you want to make sure that, that those needs are met at that college or university. And of course, cost is going to be a factor. That's part of that whole fit nowadays. You know, look at the financial aid availability. You know, merit scholarships. What do I have to do to qualify for a merit scholarship? Do I just apply to the university or do I have to fill out an additional application? There are talent-based scholarships as well. Talent-based scholarships might be music, art, theater, or they could be, um, you know, sports. They could be debate. They could be a variety of different things. And then there's always the need-based aid. I always tell students don't eliminate a school because of cost just yet because you never know what you would qualify for. You know, private institutions have some private funding. There's state and federal available for a variety of institutions if you're going to a school in your state. So those are some areas to really consider as you're starting this college search process and as you're trying to figure out where am I going to apply even though I don't know what I want to do just yet. I'm going to turn it over to Jill right now and she is going to talk on application tips. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, um, since our session is really focused for those students who are, are undecided, undeclared, undetermined, we want to make sure that we're leaving you with some tips. Jen is giving you a great list of things to think about as you're going through the process, but I'm going to focus on tips for when you're actually completing your college applications. And I, I noticed a few more participants have joined us in the last few minutes. So just as a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of our entire session, we're going to go through those questions that you have submitted. So next slide, please, Jen. All right, uh, again, these are just tips. Keep them in mind. Hopefully some of you are already working on your applications for college. Um, so again, you're an undecided student filling out your application. Sometimes the essay prompts for college applications will ask things like, so why have you chosen this particular major? Or 
when did you when did you first become interested in your major well if you're undecided it might be difficult to answer that question so i like to tell students that they should think about two to three maybe different types of majors that they've been thinking about and they can list maybe some things they like about each of those majors or perhaps they could list a couple of different majors and talk about what the commonalities are or kind of the, that connective tissue between those majors. Um, also, I think it's really important that you could maybe tackle that type of a question with maybe more about your career goal and say, you know, long term, I have a, a, a goal of maybe law school and practicing law. But for the short term, I'm kind of thinking about these three majors. That would be a great way to answer that question. Um, I noticed I just skipped over my, my first tip, which make sure whatever you put for an essay question that talks about why are you choosing this particular major, make sure that you never put I have no idea what I want to major in. Um, so you, you want to seem a little more put together than that. And um, you want to give up very positive vibes about why you might be undecided. Um, the last thing I want to leave you with for essays that are asking you to, to talk specifically about your intended major, there can be creative ways to tackle it. For many of you, the reason that you're thinking, you know, I'm kind of undecided about a major, it's because you're talented in a lot of different areas. You love math, you love science, but you also have that artsy side. So a great way to tackle an essay question asking about your major might be to do something like, you know what, I have a lot of interests. On Monday, I am a nurse because I volunteer at, you know, maybe a nursing home. Um, you could say on Tuesdays, I'm a teacher. And then you could talk about how maybe you're tutoring your younger brothers and sisters as they do their homework. So again, think creatively and don't think about, oh no, what will I do? I'm undecided. Embrace that and just tailor your essay to that. Next slide, Jen. All right. Um, my next suggestion would be for the activities list on, on the application. Please remember you only have 10 lines on most of the applications. So you want to plan ahead. Um, think about maybe the breadth of the different experiences that you've had. I think that's really important because if you're undecided, your list of activities can help the admission committee kind of know where, where you're at with all of your different interests. Um, some way that you can save some space is to kind of group some of those activities together. If you do that, if you take three activities and group them together, that saves two spots on that list of 10 spaces. So an example for this would be if you're a three sport athlete, let's say that you're in football, wrestling, and track. You could take one line for each of those and then have just seven lines left over, or you could use one space and say, I'm a three sport athlete, and then list football, wrestling, and track. So again, the goal of this with listing those activities is to show the admission committee all of those things that you're really interested in. Um, also, make sure that you don't forget to add things in that can show your passion um, as an undecided student with things that you volunteer with. So jobs, uh, volunteer efforts, um, maybe something special that your family's done, those can all be listed. And then some of you, might have way more than 10 activities that you'd like to list. It's okay, maybe list the 10 things that you think are most important or that the admission committee might, those, those things that might appeal to the admission committee. And then you can submit an extra list of activities. I checked with Jen for Denver and Scott with Indiana and along with TCU, all three of our schools do allow a student to submit an extra list of, of activities or a co-curricular resume, if you will. Next slide, Jen. Very good. Some additional tips that I want to leave you with. Um, there is different lingo for undecided, so it might be helpful for you to know what that particular university that you're applying to uses for that word. I know that at TCU we use the term pre-major. Scott told me that they use exploratory major at Indiana, and then Jen said they kind of just use undeclared as their, as their language for undecided students. 
Um, on the application, sometimes colleges will ask, what have you done to learn more about our university? They're trying to see how much you've demonstrated interest. So a way that an undecided student can show interest and extra interest, particularly academically for that university, is to have a couple of strategies. Now that everything's kind of virtual for a while, sadly it's virtual, but take advantage of it, you could look at those college websites and let's say that you have an interest in nursing, education, and speech language pathology. You could sit in on all of those different sessions on different days. So you could convey that to the admission committee. I've looked at this session and this session, and I signed up for this session, and it was helpful. Um, the other thing, when things start to open up and we have open houses back on college campuses and things like that, um, a great idea for students who are really undecided about which direction they want to go with a major, conquer and divide. If your mom and your little brother are on the trip with you, send your mom to the nursing session to take notes. You sit in on the education session, and then maybe your brother, who's a high school sophomore, could sit in on that speech language pathology session. So those are great ways for you to collect information about those different majors. Um, other things, I want you to, to know that you can look at the different academic sites. Don't rely only on the admission site. Go into the education website for TCU. Go into, you know, the business site for Denver and so on and so forth. Also, you can find the online course catalog and that's really helpful information. It can tell you about the minors that line up with majors and you can get some really good information about that. Um, also, ask teachers uh, from different areas to do your recommendation letters. Don't have two of your English teachers from your four years in high school write those recommendation letters. If you're interested in possibly majoring in science and history, have a history teacher write one of those recommendations and a science teacher write the other one. And then last but not least with this section, make sure you keep your school counselor in the loop. Let them know, hey, I'm thinking about becoming a teacher. I don't know for sure. I'm kind of undecided. Just let them know that because they can give you some great feedback. And then last but not least, um, there is an exception sometimes when an undecided major will not work very well. That would be specialized majors, competitive majors. I know at TCU we have a direct admit nursing major and only 15% of our students who apply get into that major. So that's an exception. Um, majors that require the full four years, engineering, education, um, you know, it takes every minute of those four years, those classes build on top of one another. So in those situations, if engineering's on your list, maybe don't apply undecided. Apply to engineering right away. And then last but not least, some students have been known to use undecided major as a strategy, thinking, you know what, I know this school's difficult to get into. Maybe I'll increase my chances if I put undecided instead of business. Well, at most schools, if you've been admitted undecided, but then want to change that major after you've been admitted, you need to go back through the admission committee to get approval and be admitted for that major. So it may not be a great strategy at all. And next, Scott is going to talk with you guys about some things and tips that you can take once you get to college. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Jill. So as you've heard a little bit from, uh, from Jen and from Jill about what to consider when you're thinking about applying uh, to a school, um, undecided, undeclared, we call it exploratory, and you've decided that that's the route for you, what happens then? What happens when you uh, get onto campus as a first year student? Are you on your own in this process? Um, absolutely not. Uh, schools have many opportunities for um, undecided and undeclared students to receive specialized uh, advising and support because you're not going to graduate as an undecided or undeclared student at some point across probably your first year or two at that institution you will make a decision on a major majors a major and a minor and I'll talk about some of those things in just a couple of minutes, but there are resources that will be available to you uh, on campus uh, to help you uh, decide what direction you would like to go. 
a lot of that is going to start as early as summer orientation at your first advising session. So your first year advisor, when you have a, a sit down advising session at summer orientation, will start to talk with you um, about what the opportunities are on campus and how to take advantage of those. So um, I'm certainly gonna talk a little bit about what we do at IU, but I did a little research on some other uh, institutions as well, places that you uh, probably have heard of that are, that are here at in the Midwest as well. Um, you know, when it comes to advising, um, I really did um, some research on what the University of Minnesota Twin Cities does. Um, their Center for Academic Planning and Exploration, which goes by the acronym CAPE, uh, they use that as a central resource on campus. They offer one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, major exploration workshops, um, a one-credit exploration course, peer mentoring with students that are uh, maybe juniors or seniors that have the same general interests as you. Maybe you're not quite sure which area of um, the health sciences you want to go into, but working with a peer mentor who's a junior or a senior uh, in that particular school uh, can be helpful to, to, to make some of those decisions. Uh, and so uh, CAPE also offers an annual major and minor expo every February. So where you're able to go in and meet with advisors and faculty from all of the different schools. Um, so those are some things that they do up at the U in, uh, in the Twin Cities. Um, at IU, we also offer um, uh, courses that can help students um, identify maybe a direction that they wanna go into. Uh, so all of our first year exploratory students um, are a part of what's called the university division. That's our academic home for exploratory students. Uh, and there are about a half a dozen classes. They're usually one credit hour, six or eight week classes that are electives. Many times they're taught in your residential neighborhood. And those are taught by staff from different career planning and placement offices. So folks that are working um, on the front lines in terms of uh, recruiters that are coming to campus to meet with students for internships and permanent positions, folks that work with our pre-med and our pre-law students uh, to help prepare them for professional study once they graduate. So those folks are also brought in then to teach these classes. Uh, some of them include things like X-152, Map Your Future. Uh, and a big component of X-152 is creating an e-portfolio. Uh, so really trying to imagine all the things that you're interested in, uh, the things that get you excited, that you're passionate about, and how those might translate into an academic and eventual career path. Um, Q294, College and Career, Explore Your Options, really gives you kind of that um, 30,000 foot view of all of the different programs that we have to offer on campus. There's interactions with current students as well as alumni uh, that come back to campus and talk about their experiences, not only of, of choosing a major, but how they've been able to adapt out in the workforce, knowing that there is a, a need for continuing education and it, what you end up graduating with will probably still need to be supplemented as your work career goes on to remain competitive and to remain um, uh, effective in the field that you choose. Um, we do have some uh, classes that are designed maybe uh, to narrow things down just a little bit more for you. So um, Y100 Exploring Informatics and Computer Science. So an opportunity if you're thinking about technology but you just don't know how to forge that academic pathway or that career pathway in technology. You know you like social media, but what does that mean in terms of, um, do I go in a business direction? Do I wanna be on the technology end of things? Um, that's a class that's a six week class that'll kind of help you explore that and decide which way is gonna be the best pathway for you. Uh, similar opportunities in, in K421 uh, careers and helping professions, uh, as well as T175, uh, which is um, our Kelly Compass class. IU has a, a well-known business school, the Kelly School of Business, and helping students kind of understand all the different ways that they can be involved um, in, in forging a academic and career path in business, because it is not solely through an undergraduate business degree. It may be through economics, it might be through arts management, it might be nonprofit management or event planning, advertising or public relations. So lots of different ways that you can find your way into a business career. And some of that may be through an undergraduate business degree, but maybe not, maybe that's a minor in business and taking advantage of a different type of program that really suits your interests and your passions a little bit more. So we really focus in those classroom environments with those elective classes to help you narrow down your area of interest. 
And then earlier, uh, Jen mentioned living learning communities, and um, I, I uh, did a little bit of research. I, I knew of the program already because I did my graduate work at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and I did a little bit more research. I had heard about the program Discover U Miami, which is um, for first year students who are a part of the university studies program at Miami, which is their version of what we at IU call the university division. So university studies folks have not yet declared a major. Uh, and those first year students have the opportunity to live with each other in this living learning community. Um, and as a part of that process, uh, the staff and the faculty advisors and the upper class mentors that are involved um, in Discover U Miami are gonna work with students as they solidify their majors, discover possible career paths and build community through developing friendships, um, the community and the common course requirements. So you would have some classes that you're taking together with students from that LLC. Nice, it gives you a built-in study group there. Um, they, uh, they focus on examining an individual's values, interests, personality, and skills and strengths to assist in discovering uh, your undergraduate journey and beyond. Uh, so those are some great opportunities with, with advising, with taking classes as a freshman, and also living with other students who are also exploratory and taking advantage of some of those specialized resources to really show you that there's the support for undecided students on campus. You're certainly not left to your own devices in terms of figuring all of this out. So I'll move on to the next slide here. Talk a little bit about some other opportunities that you might wanna consider. And I know uh, that Jill had mentioned um, you know, double majors and, uh, and, and uh, combining some different programs. You're going to find that customizing your undergraduate experience is really going to help you explore all of your interests. So uh, I know both of my, my panelists have, have kind of alluded to the fact that um, all of you have lots and lots of different interests, right? And you're, you're involved with things in school, outside the classroom, maybe you have some work experience, you're excited about maybe technology, but also working um, with children, or maybe you're excited about um, the media, but you're also interested in politics. You've got multiple interests and you're gonna choose at most probably two majors and a double major, but that doesn't mean that you have to stop your exploration and your discovery in these different areas. And that's where things like minors and certificates and concentrations can really uh, round out and allow you to um, layer and combine different programs on our campuses. Um, now there are certain things that are gonna be more difficult than others to pull together in terms of a double major, but you'd be surprised at the number of fantastic combinations that undergraduate students come up with and that they're able to do on all of our campuses. Um, you can even create your own major at many places. I, I know a couple of our campuses, uh, Indiana definitely uh, offers a create your own major program. We call it IMP, Individualized Major Program. Uh, and it's, it's been amazing to see uh, the different creative majors that folks have come up with, and they've really been successful with those majors. We had a young man who created his own major in comedy a couple of years ago, uh, is now a, a comedy writer um, out in Los Angeles, uh, you know, working for a, for a cable network, uh, created that major by combining uh, theater, linguistics, um, English, history, psychology, and sociology, uh, did an internship with, uh, with a comedy club, I believe it was in Chicago, uh, and was involved with different improv troops on campus, uh, and has really forged that career and his own pathway through, through that major. Um, there's also a guy that maybe some of you have, have recognized the name, Will Shorts. Uh, he's the um, crossword puzzle editor for the New York Times. He's also the puzzle master on NPR's Weekend Edition. Uh, he was actually the very first IMP uh, at IU way back in the 70s created his own major in enigmatology, which is the study of puzzles by taking uh, mathematics and psychology and cognitive sciences and neuroscience, um, history and linguistics and, and English and combining those into uh, that major in enigmatology. So don't let what you see just in a brochure be limit your imagination in terms of what you can get out of college from an academic perspective. And coming in as an undeclared or exploratory student will really allow you to uh, kind of take advantage of all of those things uh, right out of the gate. And know that 
as you move into the workforce, you're going to probably still want to continue to do that exploration. And all of our institutions continue to support alumni in an ever-changing world uh, with regards to their own uh, professional uh, growth and development. Uh, folks, I think, change careers or jobs about seven times over the course of their uh, their their uh, work life, uh, and alma maters are typically there to to help to uh, supplement what you learned in college to make sure that you're successful going on in your career through that alumni network. So I'll, I'll uh, move the slide along here. Um, we actually have a question for all of you in the audience uh, because it might be interesting to find out uh, the pathway that the three of us took. Um, I'm not aware of any place in the country that allows you to do an undergraduate degree uh, in college admission. Uh, you don't typically uh, end up in college admission uh, from the same place. Uh, so maybe if in the, in the Q&A, if you have any thoughts about what majors any of us might have had uh, when we were undergraduates at our respective institutions. Um, that might be a, a fun way to get the Q&A started and then uh, we'll answer whatever questions you have. Feel free to, to throw those into the Q&A whenever you're ready. Scott, I love that you kind of joked around about what major does, a, uh, what major did we do to become a college admission counselor? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't see any guesses thus far, so maybe we're just going to have to reveal ourselves. Um, and I can certainly, I can certainly go go first. I usually have uh, usually have at least one um, student at a at a college fair or at a at a, uh, a program will come up and say that they're interested in in majoring in history, and I'll say. That's great. You could end up as a college admissions director, just like me. I majored in history, and sometimes I get a blank stare like, <laughs> but I, I, I did major in history as well as journalism with a concentration in public relations uh, through the media school at IU. I'll go next. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I went to, um, my undergraduate degree was in speech communication. So how to talk in like a small group setting, a large group setting, give speeches. Never once did I take a class on how to stare into a camera on top of a computer <laughs> and talk to a large group of people. That never happened in the 80s. Who would have thought, right? Um, but that was my undergraduate major, speech communications. And then I went to a, oops, am I muted? Or no, I'm gonna reveal the slide here. This also has some information so you can connect with us later on, but I majored in art and I minored in theater. And the only reason I have a theater minor is because I took my sewing machine to college and one of my friends who was in theater said, hey, why don't you come with me to the theater department? I'm gonna work on something. And all of a sudden I'm sewing costumes. So, um, but I had my work study in the admissions office. So that's how I kind of fell into admissions. I really enjoyed the work there. So, um, but, we really appreciate you guys coming. If you do have any questions, whether it's related to this, this topic or whether it's just college search in general or just questions that you have, you know, I know that you guys have had an interesting time. You are, um, you know, if you're, if you're a senior now, you finished your junior year, you know, March 14th, I think was when everybody went remote. And so you've had, you've, you've endured a lot. So if you have any sorts of questions that we can assist with, we'd love to answer those for you. Yeah, so again, if you guys have any questions, you can type them into the Q&A. Mm -hmm. And if you're a quiet group, that's okay. We can tell jokes, right, guys? <laughs> yeah. And as uh, Jen mentioned, um, if you have any interest in any of our three institutions, which maybe is what you brought, brought you to this session, uh, there's mailing list information there, as well as a QR code and our email addresses. Uh, the three of us are the folks that you would be working with uh, at on some students uh, if you're interested in any of our institutions. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions coming forth. So I guess that gives us all five extra minutes for a cup of coffee, maybe. So <laughs> <laughs> oh. we hope that this, 
eased a little bit of any angst that you might have had as well. You know, being undecided, undeclared, or undetermined is just fine. You are in a good place. You don't have to make those decisions again until typically, you know, your sophomore or junior year in college. So you guys are in a really good place right now. So um, know that that's, you're in the majority too. That's the majority of kids coming into, you know, from high school into, into the college level. So you guys are not alone by any means. Oh, we do have a question actually. Oh. A student wants to know, for most of the students who go into college undecided, are they successful? Do they find their path eventually? Mm -hmm. I don't know who wants to start. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm not sure what, what type of statistics I don't have right at my fingertips, um, but I will, I'll give an anecdotal mm -hmm. Uh, story that um, that I think il il illustrates the um, mm -hmm. point I'm trying to make. So uh, we have a, a well-known business school at IU, as I mentioned. Um, about 75% of those students that are a part of the Kelly School were directly admitted. They 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 did come in right away as freshmen. So that left about 25% of students who. Um, who come in to start the sophomore year after being exploratory or pre-business in that first year. The average GPA of the students who came in after being exploratory is higher than the students who came in as direct admit. That's because they came in, they discovered that business was their passion, they did the work to get into a top business school as a freshman, and they moved right on through the process beautifully. I would say that providers and employers, grad school admissions folks, med and law school admissions folks, don't care how you got in. They care about the work that you did once you got there. Um, and so that's, that's an example I can give in terms of just that success, um, that freshman year, being exploratory and having that time to figure it all out and finding a great fit for yourself in terms of a major really pays dividends. Yeah, I'm going to add on to what Scott said. I think it's also important that you um, take advantage of the opportunities that are presented to you in that undergraduate level. Um, you know, anything that you can do to enhance your education, maybe a professor kind of gives you a little bit of a nudge and says, hey, I'm working on this project. I'd love for you to come in and, and maybe assist me in it. I like the ideas that you've presented in class. Take advantage of some of those things. You never know where those paths may lead you. And yes, you can graduate still in four years, even if you don't have a major. You just wanna make sure that um, you, know, you are getting those, those classes that you need um, the foundation curriculum, um, if there's any requirements for graduation, that you are working on those while you are trying to figure out what you're going to do. I think that, um, you know, if, if you're smart about it, you definitely have an opportunity to graduate in four years or less. Yeah, I know at TCU, we tell students that really by the second semester of your sophomore year, you really kind of need to know what direction you think you pretty much want to go for a final major, just so that you can do your academic advising session and then hit your junior year with that major. But for people who might, you know, kind of go in and out of trying on different majors, remember those credits are applying toward maybe a minor or a double minor. And definitely those are counting toward your core curriculum requirement at the college. So it's not a waste of time at all. And I suppose there are a few students who might go through two years and then decide they want to go into engineering and that might tack some time on. So just make sure you're talking to your academic advisor about what all your interest areas are and you should be in good shape. I don't see any other questions that have popped up. So it looks like we have done our job today. <laughs> um, again, if you have any questions, we did put up that slide at the end with all of our information. And have a great day. Awesome, thank you to our panelists today. As we are leaving here, um, there will be a quick survey when you close out this window. Um, and just as a final reminder again, um, we will have all of the available sessions left on WACAC.com and then all of the recordings of these sessions as well. Um, from this week and last week also on WACAC.com. So thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your day.